hearing of the Congressional Executive Commission on China. The title of this hearing is The Long Arm of China, Exporting Authoritarianism with Chinese Characteristics. I apologize to the witnesses. To, it's been a pretty busy day this morning, and it's only not even 11 o'clock yet. So. But uh, we're going to have uh, one panel testifying today. The panel will feature Shanti Kalathil, who's the Director of International Forum for Democratic Studies at the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, Dr. Glenn Tifford, an expert in modern Chinese legal history and a visiting fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Dr. Sophie Richardson, Director of China Research at Human Rights Watch. And I thank all of you for being here. Uh, before we move to the topic at hand, I want to take a moment to recognize Ms. Deidre Jackson on the Commission staff after 38 years of government work, including nearly 16 years at the Commission. This is her final hearing before retiring, hopefully to Florida. <laughs> But it'll be at the end of this year. And we are very grateful to her for her faithful service and for her important contribution to this work. So the focus of this hearing today is timely. This is an issue that merits greater attention from U.S. policymakers. And that involves the efforts of the Chinese Communist Party through its government uh, to conduct influence operations, which exist in free societies around the globe, and they're intended to censor critical discussion of China's history and human rights record, and to intimidate critics of its repressive policies. Attempts by the Chinese Communist Party and the government to guide, buy, or coerce political influence and control discussion of sensitive topics are pervasive, and they pose serious challenges to the United States and to our like-minded allies. The Commission convened a hearing looking at China's long arm in May of 2016, and the focus at that time was on individual stories from dissidents and right defenders, journalists, family members of critics of the regime who shared alarming accounts of the intimidation, harassment, pressure, and fear they felt as a result of their work. This was especially true for those who had families still living in China, and this issue persists. Just recently, Chinese authorities reportedly detained over 30 relatives of the uh, U.S.-based Uyghur human rights activist Rubeya Kadir, a frequent witness before this commission. We'll no doubt hear similar accounts when Dr. Richardson explores some of what Human Rights Watch documented in its recent report on China's interference at the United Nations human rights mechanisms. Beyond that, we hope today to take a step back from individual accounts regarding China's long arm and examine the broader issue of Chinese Communist Party's influence around the world. What animates their efforts? What is their ultimate aim? what sectors or institutions are most vulnerable to this, and what can we do about it. Given the scope of this issue, we'll only begin to scratch the surface here today. When examining these foreign influence operations, it's important we understand the Communist Party infrastructure that exists to support this endeavor. The United Front Work Department is one of the party agencies in charge of influence operations at home and abroad. The Chinese president elevated this entity's status in 2014, calling their work the, quote, magic weapon, unquote, for the Chinese people's great rejuvenation. The UFWD is charged with promoting a positive view of China abroad and exporting the purported benefits of its authoritarian model. United Front officials and their agents, often operating under diplomatic cover as members of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they develop relationships with politicians at both the state, local, and federal level, and other high-profile or up-and-coming foreign and overseas Chinese individuals, too, in the words of Wilson Center Global Fellow Anne-Marie Brady, quote, influence, subvert, and if necessary, bypass the policies of their governments and promote the interests of the CCP globally, end quote. A key element in this long-arm effort has focused on information technology and internet governance or sovereignty asserting national control of the internet and social media platforms, not only in recent domestic cyber legislation and development plans, but also at international gatherings. So we look forward to Ms. Calithil's testimony, which will further explore this important dimension of the Chinese government's efforts. China's developed tools to surveil social media and mobile phone texting platforms and to disrupt overseas websites that contain content the government finds politically sensitive. Earlier this year, it was reported that real-time censorship of instant messaging platforms is now taking place. Private group chats are censored without users' knowledge. As it relates to China's long arm, the University of Toronto Citizen Lab, a human rights and information technology research center, reported in the middle part of January of this year on Chinese government censors' work to prevent Tibetans inside and outside of China from discussing the Dalai Lama major's, major's religious teachings in India. The Chinese government is also clearly targeting academia, 
the party deems historical analysis and interpretation that do not hew to the party's ideological and official story as dangerous and threatening to its legitimacy. Recent reports of the censorship of international scholarly journals illustrate the Chinese government's direct request to censor international academic content, something which Professor Tiffert will address. Related to this is the proliferation of Confucius Institutes and with them insidious curbs on academic freedom. These are a major concern, an area which CECC co-chairman, our co-chairman here, Congressman Smith, has been sounding the alarm on for some time. Chinese foreign investment and development, which is slated to reach record levels with the Belt and Road Initiative, is accompanied by a robust political agenda aimed in part at shaping new global norms on development, trade, and even human rights. There's much more that has been publicly reported in just the last few months, and even more that will likely never be known. The academic whose scholarly paper provides background on the banned Chinese Democratic Party or other politically sensitive issues refused a visa to conduct research in China, or the Hollywood studio that has to shelf film scripts with a storyline involving China's abuse of the Tibetan people, the Washington think tank that puts out policy papers critical of legislative initiatives that would negatively impact the Chinese government, all the while never revealing their financial ties with senior Chinese officials. Or the American internet company willing to censor content globally in order to obtain access to the Chinese market. There, these are endless scenarios. Some I think have happened, some are happening, and some will continue to happen. And it relates directly to Chinese foreign influence operations in both their scope and in their reach. There's an important growing body of research on this topic. So without objection, we will keep the, the hearing record open for 48 hours to submit some additional relevant materials in that regard, including the executive summary of an important report by the National Endowment for Democracy, Sharp Power, Rising Authoritarian Influence, which outlines in part China's influence operations and in young democracies, including two of them, in our own hemisphere in Latin America. Each year, the Commission releases an annual report which painstakingly documents human rights and rule of law developments in China. China's Great Firewall, rights violations in ethnic minority regions, harassments of rights of defenders and lawyers, suppression of free speech, onerous restrictions on civil society, these are the shameful markings of an authoritarian one-party state. But to the extent that the same authoritarian impulses animate the Chinese government's efforts abroad, it directly threatens our most deeply held values and our national interest. The Chinese leaders are engaged in the long game. And it is something that policymakers in the United States and with our like-minded allies must take seriously. Uh, Congressman Smith uh, is not here in attendance. He's in the middle of a hearing in the House, but will be with us shortly. I also welcome uh, Senator King. Um, and do you wish to say anything for the record at the opening? And if not, then we're going to welcome our witnesses. And uh, I guess we'll begin with you, Ms. Califill, and just work down the row. And I thank you, and I apologize again for our late start. but. Uh, as I said, it's 11 o'clock and it feels like it's five. <laughs> but, uh, thank you for being here, all of you. Can I interject on this? this is an important point. So when you answer no, I think what you're answering, and if I'm wrong, please correct me. I don't want anybody to say that I'm leading you in your answer because I want this to be, I want your views on this to be accurately reflected. The question was, how does it compare to Russian interference? And I think the answer you've given is there's no evidence that they're posting stuff on Twitter or Facebook for purposes of dividing the American people against each other. On the other hand, Senator King asked about Australia. What we have seen around the world, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, is an effort to identify and nurture office holders, think tanks, opinion makers, journalists, uh, academia, uh, and encourage them both to enter in public service and even to rise. We've seen open source reports, for example, of outreach to local and state elected officials, perhaps anticipating that one day they will hold federal office or we've seen uh, reports of uh, implied threats to cut off access to the Chinese market for companies based in certain states, unless those states' authorities uh, are cooperative or, 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 or make statements friendly towards their cause. So it's, I would argue that is influence. I think it's different. I think it's softer, more subtle, more long-term, but nevertheless, it reflects what we saw in Australia, where a member of parliament resigned after there were accusations made that not only had he tipped off a Chinese national of some alleged uh, intelligence operation being conducted against him, but that he perhaps allegedly had received cash from a wealthy Chinese national, which he had used to pay off personal debts. 
Um, again, no evidence that that has occurred in the United States, but that level of influence, trying to play in the politics and nurture a view and individuals who hold views friendly to the narrative they're trying to put out, that you have seen evidence of. Do you want to... Absolutely, and, and I think in one sense what distinguishes the Chinese efforts to wield influence in the United States is that they are uh, spending a great deal more money uh, to do that. They have commercial advantages, uh, and so they're able th through, for example, Confucius Institutes to promote a particular view of China and to close out discussion of certain topics on campus. Uh, they're able to donate money to particular causes. Much of this is legal activity, but they're able simply to wield influence because they can write checks. Uh, and that is something that we did not face as a country uh, during the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Their pockets were not as deep. Uh, China is not necessarily appealing to hearts and minds, it's appealing to wallets. I would also add that, um, you know, in our recent report on sharp power, we explicitly looked at Chinese influence in young democracies and vulnerable democracies and found that um, through a number of different avenues, including through investments in the media, including through massive investments in people-to-people -people exchanges, um, the Chinese government is really promoting a certain narrative. And um, that narrative, of course, then enables it to achieve its own interests in various ways. So while it may be hard to um, point a finger at specific uh, election-related issues or specific political meddling at the moment, there's no doubt that there are massive and extreme efforts to exert influence through a number of things that otherwise would have been seen as soft power, perhaps in a, through a different lens. Um, but when you consider that the, the aim of buying up media outlets, particularly Chinese language media outlets, but not limited to that, is really to shape a narrative and to constrain discourse about China in particular, rather than to open the discourse and to enable many different critical perspectives. And that also is a very um, long-term and pernicious form of influence. Just to drill down on that point, <clears throat> there are different ways of influencing. There's the more frontal traditional approach that we have seen evidence of in 2016, and that involves the posting and the driving of certain information in order to exploit divisions, existing divisions within a society in and of itself. And I have opined publicly that that's my view that more than anything else, this was designed to create chaos within the political order in the United States and, and uh, sow instability and, and ensure that the next president, whoever that was, inherited a societal conflict and a political mess. And uh, what you're describing is different. It is a changing the environment in which that debate is occurring, particularly as it relates to a particular country's worldview. And you all keep going back, and I think Dr. Tiffert, you talked about that in your uh, opening statement. You described efforts to project a, quote, China model globally as an alternative uh, to the liberal, liberal order, which for decades has, uh, since the end of World War II, has anchored uh, by the United States. So I would ask all of you, if you can concisely, what, what is the narrative? What is this model? What is the message that they are pushing? In essence, what do they want us to accept as conventional wisdom about China and its role in the world and, the way, and international norms in 10, 15, 20 years? What are they asking people to buy into? Well, I would briefly say that in this instance, it's instructive to look at the rhetoric surrounding China's Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. The key phrase that, that is attached to that initiative is community of common destiny. And I think it's notable that, um, you know, you talked about how authoritarian regimes are trying to use democracy's openness against them. They're also subverting the rhetoric of democracy. They are explicitly using terms like openness and community and um, terms that seem to imply a sort of networked model of the world that is not unlike that pushed by the liberal international order over the last many years. The difference is that uh, there is also um, underlying all of this uh, a quite explicit message of non-interference in sovereignty and that of course in China's case fits directly into its worldview and how it would like other countries to treat it. Um, and you see this also in its approach to internet governance. You see it in, in many of its different initiatives. Um, but it's, it's notable that I, I would say China is not trying to say, be just like us. It is actually trying to use this very inclusive 
language to paint a picture that seems like a reasonable alternative to the liberal international order, one that appeals to small states, to countries that feel vulnerable, to those that feel they, that they might be safer or have more of a say in a multipolar world. And it is this sort of approach that I think is actually new and more sophisticated and one that we actually have to think deeply about how to uh, address. And Congressman Smith has joined us. I'm going to recognize him in a moment while he gets organized because I want to finish these thoughts. And this is really at the core of what this hearing is about. A couple things you've touched on. The first, and you said it earlier in response to Senator King, is uh, we, um, let me back up and say that we often are guilty of ascribing our domestic political attributes to foreign actors, right? We, we, or, or foreign nations, uh, other nations. We, we think to ourselves, this is the way we, this is what it means here, so this is what it must mean over there. So when the United States, whether it's McDonald's or Coca-Cola or Apple or Facebook, go to another country, they are not there at the behest of the United States government. They're not even under the control of the United States government. And oftentimes in academia, perhaps more often than not in many cases, they're certainly not under our control. In fact, many times go abroad and are critical of the United, their own country and vice versa, which is their right on, in a free society. One of the things we've heard from you today is that when you look at the toolbox, the influence toolbox that the Chinese Communist Party has in its government, all of these things are part of that toolbox. In essence, when you are engaging in commercial relationships with a Chinese company, especially, potentially a large one in, in, in essence, you're not dealing with an independent multinational actor. You are dealing with an entity that grew large and is capable of operating because they are willing to be cooperative and in some cases act as an agent on behalf of whatever it is is being asked of them. And I think that poses threats up and down from technological transfers, the, in, the embedding uh, information and technology that can ultimately wind up here in this country because somebody's using that equipment to, for our telecom networks, all the way to uh, the information about what you buy on a certain website or the credit card and biographical information. And that's a real important distinction. And the other point that you talked about was kind of buying into the non-interference argument, and here's where you know, we have a couple examples of how this effort is bearing fruit in different parts of the world. So we had a vote a couple, I guess back in the summer of this year, in which Greece blocked a European Union statement at the United Nations criticizing China's human rights record. And uh, there was a lot of, well, what is that all about? And, and then you look further and you realize that China's Costco shipping is the owner of the world's fourth largest container fleet had just taken a 51% stake in Greece's largest port last year. So again, you tie those two things together, maybe they're related, maybe they're not, I believe that they are, but you start to see where the political of a large Chinese company, the, the economic angle, the economic power of a large Chinese conglomerate is able to wield influence over a smaller economy and how it votes at an international forum. Then we have the issue of access to this large market that people are dying for. And so, Again, this is where you come into this absurd situation where the World Internet Conference is held in China, meant to promote China's vision of cyber sovereignty, which all of you have talked about. Basically, the idea that governments all over the world should have the right to control what appears on the internet in their countries. Uh, the most confusing part of it all is that Apple's CEO, Tim Cook, stood up at that conference and he celebrated China's vision of an open internet. He delivered the keynote speech on the opening day of that gathering. He wasn't there alone, by the way. Um, he was joined by, uh, let's see, some of the other attendees from Google and Cisco. But the most ironic part about it is that in a written response to questions to my, our colleagues, Senator Leahy and Senator Cruz, back in June, uh, or earlier this year, I'm not remember the month, maybe it was back in November, Apple admitted that it had removed 674 VPN apps from its app store in China these are tools that allow users, of course, to, to circumvent censorship by routing traffic through other countries. Uh, and to comply with, to comply with the, what they said they were complying with local law, Skype was also removed from Apple's China store, uh, as was reported by the New York Times. So again, here's an example of a company, uh, in my view, so desperate to have access to the Chinese marketplace that they are willing to follow the laws of that country, even if those laws run counter to what the company's own standards are supposed to be. And a, and a good example for the United States and for our people, how some of these individuals who like to come here and lecture us about free speech and human rights and 
domestic problems than go abroad and are fully cooperative on some grotesque violation of human rights because there's a lot of money to be made and they don't want to offend their host country. And then the last thing I would point to as we, before I turn it over to Congressman Smith is uh, there's the story that we all are now aware of of a University of Maryland valedictorian who experienced uh, after her commencement speech where she praised free speech in the U.S. as a breath of fresh air. Um, she experienced this sort of onslaught of online attacks. And um, you know, in your written testimony, Ms. Calithel, you, you wrote how Chinese government fabricates about 448 million social media comments a year to inject certain narratives. But you know, that's unfortunately not an isolated case. We have a number of others, and these are just a, a handful. Uh, an overseas university provoked complaint. This month, for example, a lecture, or this, was, this article's dated, but at some point, a lecturer from Monash University in Australia was suspended after a Chinese student complained on Weibo of a classroom quiz that appeared to insult Chinese officials. In 2010, the University of Calgary announced, um, announced that the Chinese, China's education ministry had removed it from the list of accredited overseas institutions. That came weeks after that university had awarded an honorary degree to the Dalai Lama. Uh, we saw how the University of California at San Diego prompted the local chapter of the Chinese Students and Scholars Association to threaten, quote, tough measures to resolutely resist the school's unreasonable behavior because they had planned a speech by the Dalai Lama. So you start to see these things. These are all evidence of the different tools in that toolbox, which leads me to my final question for all of you. And that is, well, my final question here, because Congressman Smith has, has questions for you too. Obviously, you are outspoken on this cause. All of you have done a significant amount of work. We have read some of the efforts that have been used to intimidate or otherwise. Are any of you willing to share any experiences you have had based on your work, whether it's efforts to discredit it, whether it's efforts to influence people against their opinion or beyond? What have you experienced, if anything? Maybe you've experienced nothing. But what have you experienced as a result of the work you've done on this topic? And in particular, appearing here at this hearing today, we often find that our witnesses in these hearings, especially if they're Chinese or and have family back home, face consequences for that. But in your particular cases, have you ever faced anything that made you feel as if it was a result of your work on this topic? Personally, I have not to date within the United States. In China, working on the topics that I work on, I, I come under significant pressure, and the informants and people that I speak to also do. And I think that goes with the territory, and it's well recognized among people who work on modern China and contemporary issues in China. Uh, I have to say that in the classroom, I've not experienced uh, any negative uh, activity or any of the personal outrage that we've seen at other universities, say in Australia. Uh, to my teaching, I've been spared that. I found Chinese students to be extremely thoughtful and even open-minded about issues that are passionately felt at home. But there definitely is the danger, uh, and early career academics are highly conscious of this, that uh, there's, there's always the possibility that a minority might express unhappiness or outrage at something that is taught because it's different than the way they've been taught it. And that produces unwelcome controversy. And for faculty, because of the decline of tenure, faculty become risk averse. They don't want to cause controversy because they're also concerned that their universities may not adequately support them in the event that the Chinese students on Scholars Association or even a smaller group of students uh, take issue with something that happens in the classroom. And so there's, there's a self-censorship, a chilling of speech that occurs as well. Yeah, I, um, I also have not personally experienced um, that in particular, but I would concur with Dr. Tifford's uh, views on, as I've taught classes, you know, I think some of the Chinese students in my class are surprisingly willing to be open about their criticisms, and um, it, it would be indeed sad if pressure on them by the embassy, which I gather is starting to happen with more regularity, would uh, constrain them from expressing their views in what is meant to be a free and open setting, and that is a trend that I, I think would be quite, quite terrible. I can only recall maybe one or two conversations over the years, you know, the, the dozen years I've been at Human Rights Watch, in which Chinese government officials said anything that might have risen to the level of being threatening, but not uh, certainly not anything that made me change my job. Um, 
you know, it is, for us, the, the enormous challenge is about how we are able to do research and, and correctly calculating what threats to people who talk to us actually are. Uh, you know, and that, that has gotten more challenging over the years, is ensuring the safety of the people that we've interviewed in the same way that, you know, you were talking about the safety or what happens to people who've come and testified before you. Thank you. We, I guess before we wrap up, I did want to give you all a chance to talk more in depth about the United Front Work Department, one of these agencies that seems to be the umbrella group for influence, because it seems like there's a, look, information has always been valuable, right? And our approach to information has largely been to open up our, our political process here in the United States, allow the world to watch it, and through our example, hopefully influence them and say, you see, you can have a pluralistic society where people disagree about things, they argue about it, and in the end, you can still govern. And we've been less than perfect, but in the process, people have seen our imperfections. And we've debated some substantial societal issues over the last 50 years, some of which seem to bring us to the point seem to bring us to the point of collapse, and yet nevertheless, our nation persevered. What's changed is the democratization of information, in essence, making it so diffuse, so easy to access from so many different sources on an hourly basis has had great positives. It has given us the opportunity for people all over the world to be quickly informed. It's also created the opportunity for people to be misinformed and for information to be denied to them, or only certain information to be provided. And so today we continue with the existing model, and I'm not arguing that we should change it, but you turn on the television and there is a station for every, no matter what your opinion is, there's a station out there prepared to confirm it. We have, in the case of China, an entity or an, a government who, that has realized that this is a powerful weapon and that our openness creates the space to provide information over a substantial period of time in a slow and patient way to change the environment. It seems like this agency uh, or department is at the tip of that spear. It, if you could just talk a little bit about who they are, what they do, but it, ultimately it seems to be that it is from there where all of these efforts emanate, whether it's sending people, influencing people, providing information, such as what, who are they, what's their purview, um, what do they do? I think the story has to begin with the history of the Chinese Communist Party as a hunted revolutionary movement uh, over a century ago. They developed very keen strategies, helped by the Soviet Union, in fact, to cultivate allies among influential people in society, to neutralize opposition to the point where they would get the upper hand. The United Front Work Department is the tip of that spear pointed out of China in order to cultivate friends and allies, influence people abroad. Basically, it's their Dale Carnegie strategy um, of making friends and influencing people and doing it underground in a way that's non-obvious. Uh, and so uh, it, it's a, it's a one-stop shop that coordinates national strategy for that purpose. And so the United Front Work Department is engaged with influencing foreign media, influencing uh, foreign academia, uh, there have been, you know, many people uh, carry sort of closet portfolios in the United Front Work Department who are working in Chinese news agency. Their agenda basically is to reshape the international environment in order to make it friendlier to China and advance China's policy goals without seeming to act specifically as the state. I'll just add to that that I think many people outside China circles and actually, frankly, plenty of people in them too, are, are not terribly aware of entities like the United Front Work Department. And look, to, to American or English speaking political ears, it almost, it's, a, it's a funny sounding term. You know, it almost sounds like a public works department as if they took care of the pipes or something like that. And I think there's not much recognition, you know, that, that the United Front Work Department and other things like the people's friendship associations or patriotic fraternal associations are really at the end of the day wholly owned subsidiaries of either the Chinese government or the party. They're not independent entities. Uh, there's also the reality that as the United Front Work Department approaches uh, you know, political parties or institutions around the world, it's not as if those institutions can then reach out to the alternatives to the United Front Work Department or to a different Chinese political party. You know, they, don't, they don't get options because those aren't permitted to 
exist. And there's no, you know, there's no rule that says just because you've met with the United Front Work Department, you now need to meet with somebody who's critical of the Chinese government. And so I think as a vehicle, it's very powerful, and there aren't other obvious voices uh, to go out and, and to listen to. Um, I, just to add briefly to that, which I think those are all very good points, I would also say that it is not only about the United Front Work Department, as we have probably demonstrated in our testimony today. I think, you know, to go back to um, a concept that I referred to in my testimony, I think that the this was in respect to China's system of internet control, but it really could be applied to its system of external influence also. The idea is to have redundancy built into every layer. And so it's not just about what the United Front Work, United Front Work Department is doing. It's also about joint ventures that are entered into with companies, um, particularly Hollywood or technology, other companies, that shape the environment so that China can achieve its strategic interests. If we're not aware of that entire environment, I think we are also probably missing part of the, part of the puzzle. And I think you touched on just a couple of little random notes I want to leave on the record so that they're clear that they were discussed today. The first is you just mentioned entertainment in Hollywood. There's been, you know, multiple reports of, and I alluded to it earlier, movie scripts, entertainment that was uh, altered for, for purposes of ensuring that that product had access to the Chinese market. They changed. Um, you know, I always got to chuckle. Also, the reports that I read about the Chinese Communist Party were big fans of season one of, of uh, what's the name of, of that? Uh, House of Cards. House of Cards. They were not big fans of season two uh, uh, for different reasons. So, um, so that, uh, again, it's just, I, I think the average person doesn't realize there are actually movies that are changed here in America because they want to make sure the script is something that doesn't cause it to not have access to this growing important market. So just the strategic use of its consumer power in and of itself uh, could require everything from altering scripts to figuring out what they will require companies to put in these devices uh, in case uh, intelligence officials ever decide to turn it on. So when you see that a, a American telecom carrier or provider or whatever has signed a deal with a company that has the sponsorship and support of the Chinese Communist Party, you should assume that as part of that, you are inheriting something on this device that could potentially, whether it's on the network or on your device, uh, make you individually vulnerable to surveillance at some point in the future. Again, uh, something that we need to understand because that's our companies don't do that. You can't go to them and say, you must put stuff on your phone that allow us to listen to anybody we want, anywhere we want, when we tell you to. We have legal processes if that's even ever done. The second is I want to quote from a report. This will also, I, I, I want to, it's not already, it may be redundant, but I want this full report to be included in the record without objection. It's a December 2017 report this month from the National Endowment for Democracy about Latin America, an area that I spent a lot of time working on in the Foreign Relations Committee. And I quote from it saying, Beijing's strategy clearly targets Latin American elites, prominent regional leaders from multiple fields, including politicians, academics, journalists, foreign, uh, former diplomats, current government officials, students, among others, are subtly, that's the key word, subtly being enticed by the Chinese government through personal interaction with the ultimate purpose of gaining their support for China. As a result, many of these renowned and influential people have already become de facto ambassadors of the Chinese cause, and I would add de facto unwitting ambassadors. I don't think they know that they are targeted for this effort. Uh, and to some extent, all countries try to do that. Um, they try to convince you uh, in one direction or another, but this is a orchestrated effort in a part of the world. Um, and it's, it goes on to read, the people-to-people -people engagement money is key. Free of charge trainings, exchange programs, scholarships in China have proven to be effective tools to engage Latin America's regional elites, an idea that was supported in 2016 by Xi Jinping that when he announced he trained 10,000 Latin Americans by 2020. The media and academia are two areas of priority attention for these efforts. Consequently, China is determined to promote cooperation of different kinds between media companies, universities, and think tanks, both at the regional and country level. Education and culture are increasingly important in Beijing's toolkit as well." End quote. And it almost leads me to feel like 50 years from now, when historians write about this period of time, they're going to write that policymakers here were lulled to sleep on a bunch of matters while this massive effort was happening right underneath us, and we didn't even realize it. It's almost the analogy of the frog in the boiling pot 
You know, if you throw it in the boiling pot, it jumps right out. But if you let it sit there as the water heats up, it boil, that boil it never even notices they're being boiled to death. On uh, another matter of, of interest that I want to make sure is noted is a Wall Street Journal article that reported Facebook is trying everything to re-enter China, including developing censorship tools. And I want the record to reflect that at an open hearing of the Intelligence Committee, I asked specifically about it, and the answer from the General Counsel was, and I believe it was the General Counsel was, we comply with the laws of the countries that we operate in. And so what that basically means is that Facebook, at least according to the information provided to us, was prepared to install censorship filters in order to get access to China um, and their market. And, uh, and it's an important thing to remember uh, as we move forward. I have a final question, and this is really relates to the first point that I was making. Just as they undertake those efforts in Latin America, I think there's evidence that those efforts exist here as well. And you all alluded to a moment ago about a representative of the RNC that was in, in China recently at a, at a conference on political parties. We know there's extensive travel, members of Congress and staff. And I guess my question is, what can we better do to educate staffers or on lobbyists or people-to-people -people exchange opportunities that are sponsored by, whether it's the United Front or its affiliated organizations or anyone, in essence, is it not incumbent upon, Paul, we're not gonna prevent these trips, but isn't it incumbent upon us to inform members of our staff and members of the House and Senate that when you go on these trips, here's why they do the trips, this is the kind of things they do. Um, by the way, they're not the only country in the world that does it, the Cuban government does this as well, but shouldn't there be something in place, a protocol in place where when you accept one of these trips from certain countries, you are made aware of the fact that these trips are not done the way Belgium does them or somebody else does them, there is a rationale behind it, and that is to win you over uh, to, to their narrative and, and to what they want policy to be. I'm happy to give you the affirmative yes. <laughs> there should be a protocol that does that. I, you know, I agree that those trips shouldn't be prevented, but people need to understand why they've been asked and how the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government will construe they're accepting those offers. Absolutely, I, I would absolutely agree with that. There needs to be a tremendous amount of consciousness raising on the depth and sophistication of the influence operations that are going on in the United States. Uh, and beyond that, people who are invited to go should understand that they've probably been invited for very specific reasons uh, because of who they are, what their views might be, or where they sit in an organizational food chain in order to, um, to exercise that kind of influence that the Chinese government is hoping to have over them and potentially policy making. And I would just add to step back and put it in the context of democracies in general, and in particular the emerging and vulnerable democracies that you referred to in Latin America and elsewhere, um, there is a distinct lack of knowledge about China in many of these places, particularly in the countries in Latin America, in the countries that make up China's 16 plus one initiative in Central and Eastern Europe. There is not that deep breadth of knowledge, which is demonstrated by my fellow panelists here, that can speak to these issues. And so a lot of times these people go into the ex exchanges with no context. And so, you know, what I would like to see happen generally in democracies is for there to be more um, context and learning around this, more transparency, and perhaps some kind of, as you get through that, uh, voluntary uh, agreement to certain norms around whether it's exchanges or academic publishing or anything, but something that allows people to feel that they are not in it alone. So if you're a university that's being approached by a Chinese counterpart and asked to compromise your academic freedom, you can reach out to others and understand that there's a common understanding of what is and isn't uh, beneficial to democracies in that regard. Uh, and that's, I think, would be a good first step. A final quick question, we're running out of time. Um, are any of you aware of efforts, whether it's in academia and entertainment or anywhere, for universities, for example, to come together and confront this threat to academic freedom, establish some level of standards about what they will and will not do in the universities, um, you know, a collective effort to all affirmatively say, we don't care if you're going to deny us trips and, and access uh, to, to the marketplace or even to students or to exchanges or the ability to have a campus on the mainland. Uh, we are not going to allow you to pressure and, and undermine academic freedom. Are you aware of any such efforts to create some sort of joint effort, whether it's in the entertainment industry or in academia? 
I think they're incipient. I hope that they continue and develop further. There are conversations that are beginning to happen along those lines as consciousness about the breadth of influence operations is, is getting raised. We're nowhere near where we need to be, though. I, just by chance, I happened to spend Sunday morning with a group of China-focused academics, and this issue dominated our conversation. And I think it's fair to say that there's enormous interest uh, in having some sort of set of principles or a code of conduct, but I think there's also a recognition of how difficult it would be to get institutions to sign on to that uh, for fears about loss of funding or you know, the desires of fundraisers or administrators versus the interests of faculty. Uh, but I think, there's, I think there is momentum to capitalize on. And I, I've seen that incipient movement, which I think is terrific. I do think that that is more likely to occur in institutions that already privilege certain types of democratic expression, such as university campuses or media organizations um, in areas such as technology or entertainment companies where the motive is to access China's market and there is no underlying value base there. I think that is much more difficult. Well, then I'll close with these three very quick comments uh, as a matter of, of, I suppose, personal privilege in this regard. The first is, I hope my colleagues, uh, when, if they ever read this record or if it's ever reported what we're about to talk about here or what we've talked about here today, um, realize that big companies, corporations, business interests, their obligation is to their shareholders and or owners to make money. China is an enormous marketplace, and so they are driven by that, and they are prepared to advocate for virtually anything that allows them access to that marketplace. They don't, they are not, just because they have an English name and happen to be headquartered in the United States does not make them advocates of the, of the principles that we need to balance as, as a public policy makers. And we should be wary of that because oftentimes some of the strongest advocates for tyrannical regimes are the businesses and individuals that are making good money in that market due to their relationship with the current tyrannical government and their basic argument is don't mess it up. Yeah, we've got a good thing going, and we've lived through that with, with uh, Russian sanctions, to some extent a little bit with Venezuela sanctions, and clearly when it comes to China over and over again. Which leads me to my second point, and that is a purse of kind of a sense of frustration about this issue. The reaction to today's hearing will be one of two things. Number one, largely ignored. Um, <clears throat> or number two, the argument that we're paranoid, that this is paranoia. This is ridiculous. This is not at all what's happening. And, and, and of course, that furthers the narrative that the Chinese Communist Party is always putting out that, you know, we're just a small, uh, poor country trying to just catch up to where you are. We're not in any way threat to you. Which, but, but the first part of ignoring really bothers me because there'll be a lot of coverage today about whatever the president or someone else tweeted this morning. Meanwhile, this extraordinary geopolitical issue that has incredible historical importance uh, of a way that people will write and talk about for a century is happening right underneath us and very few people realize it and those that do would rather talk about um, whatever the outrage of the day is. I don't even know. I haven't gone online to see what it is. Um, and the last point, and I always make this in these hearings, is I want to be abundantly clear. I, this is not about the Chinese people. It's not even about China, who we hope will emerge. It doesn't have to have our system of government per se. There's all sorts of different ways to structure democracies. The, we, no one is more hopeful than we are, and me personally, to have a China that is a partner in the international community. Can you imagine what a China that respects human rights and the liberty and the dignity of all people, their own and others abroad, could do in partnership with the United States, the issues we could confront and solve? It would be extraordinary development in human events if that were to occur. So this is in no way a hostility towards the people. On the contrary, um, I have incredible respect for the... Uh, achievements and the importance of Chinese culture and Chinese history, a nation that for almost all of human history has been the most important or one of the most important in the world, has made extraordinary contributions in the arts and the sciences and, uh, and in, in, in learning and academia. I want that potential and that history to be unleashed to change the world in a positive way. Unfortunately, that is not what we see. What we see here on the behalf of the government and the Communist Party is an effort to roll back uh, the advances towards human freedom that have been made over the last hundred years and particularly since the end of the Second World War. And that's also important to communicate because sometimes when we talk about China, it means 
into the minds of some that were talking about the Chinese, and we are not. We are fully cognizant that in a nation that large with that many people, there are hundreds of millions of people who aspire to a different way forward but simply do not have the way to advocate for it or are punished for advocating for it, sometimes even with their lives. And so that's always important to leave clear on the record. So with that, uh, the record for this hearing, as I said at the outset, is going to remain open for 48 hours, so additional documents and information can be provided. I thank all of you for being here, for your patience. It's been a, a long hearing, but I think an important one. We're adjourned.